on perfect yep you're on. okay hi everybody um great to see you i can't really see you thanks for being here today i'm glad that you took time out of your day to join me to learn about myofunctional disorders and orofacial myofunctional therapy this is an area within the field of speech pathology that i am passionate about that i love and i've spent the last eight to nine years kind of honing in on it and um perfecting all the things that I've learned over the years, treating my patients, working with an interdisciplinary team to best get to get the best results for my patients. And I'm super excited to share it with you today. Um, I, what I want to do is I know that you guys are here today because you've heard about myofunctional therapy. Of course, everybody has different backgrounds and um, comes from maybe different avenues within the field of speech pathology. Um, the greatest part about being a speech therapist is that we can take the skills that we've maybe honed in on and, and used over the past years and myofunctional therapy fits within our scope of practice. So we all come to the table with different expertise, but we're going to be able to use that to best treat our patients. And for those of you that haven't seen um, this month's... Ask if everyone can... Oh, okay. okay. Good. Just say, is everyone here to see me? I hope everybody can see me. If you have any trouble with um, seeing me or anything rolling through your um, website, please let us know. I am here with a, a support team, which I'm so, so lucky to have. So Julie is with me. She's my right-hand woman. She is like technical support, marketing support, registration support, communication support. She is everything. She will take care of it. So she's here today to help me. Um, I have another couple support team members out in the main room um, to also make sure that we are effective and productive today. So don't hesitate to reach out with questions. I really want this to be somewhat of an interactive webinar. So as you have questions, as you think of things that you're not sure about, or if you just want to share information that you already know, please don't hesitate to chime in and share it because I love this to be a conversation in a sense. Um, I wanted to say for those of you that have not gotten this month's ASHA leader, you should go run out and get it. You should make sure that you can receive it because it is all about myofunctional therapy. And I read Nicole, I met Nicole Archambault at this year's ASHA. She's amazing and I'm wish her so many congratulations for a, an article, article well written and well received. And it talks about breathing and how it relates to myofunctional therapy and to the patients that we see. So um, run out and get it read up on it and it's going to get you even more excited about this niche market within our field. So let's get jumping right into our um, presentation. So Julie, you make sure that I'm doing this right. Mm -hmm. So it's not letting me turn my screen share on. This is where I need my technical That's support. Fine. Great, excellent. So what I'm hoping has happened is that you guys can see the first page of my PowerPoint, and I think I'm in the corner speaking to you, and Julie is gonna, and my team is gonna confirm that. But um, what I've created for you here is kind of a snapshot into what orofacial myofunctional therapy is, and I really tailor it to a speech therapist approach to myofunctional therapy. There are lots of practitioners out there that provide this therapy, but I'm only going to speak to the speech therapists out there because um, this is what we are meant to do. So the big question is, what is orofacial myofunctional therapy? Well, essentially, in a really elementary, basic level, it is the neurologic re-education of repatternizing and optimizing our oral and facial structures and functions. You know, form and function go hand in hand. And we want to make sure that we are creating appropriate form and function when we're treating our little guys and older individuals that we work with. I want you to take a look at this picture um, above. This is a client of mine from quite a few years ago. And his story is so interesting and to me it's quintessential myofunctional. He received speech therapy for many years when he was younger. What did he receive speech therapy for? Yeah, you can guess it, for his S's and his Z's, for his sibilant sounds, because he had a forward production of them. And it was, a, you know, when he was really little, it was adorable. Speech therapist came in, said that she remediated it, but it wasn't really fully remediated. 
because by the time he got into elementary school, some people were still making fun of him for spitting on them when he spoke. Um, at the dinner table, mom and dad were so aware of that he was the messiest eater at the table and food in, was spilling out as he was eating, um, always with an open mouth posture, tongue hanging through his teeth when you watch TV. And what mom and dad didn't know is that all of these kind of red flags all fit together in a picture. They fit together in a picture profile of a myofunctional disorder. So what originally was thought, was thought of as being an anterior lisp really was part of a bigger picture of a myofunctional disorder. And so what this gentleman succeeded at was he came to me. Um, we, of course, addressed the speech sounds for which he was coming in for. But that really was almost um, a secondary thought. Our initial goals for this gentleman was to establish nasal breathing. He was a mouth breather. His tongue hung forward between his teeth. While we were treating him, we initiated some orthodontic approaches as well. And I sent him to a good friend of mine who um, fitted him with a palatal expander and a front and front four braces. So we did some preliminary work, expansion, took place and then we got to work as soon as that expander came out and we worked on nasal breathing, breathing re-education. We worked on strengthening the muscles of his tongue so that he could swallow and chew, chew and swallow and speak and breathe properly. And I want you to look at this picture off to the right because this is um, a post picture, you know, this is a year later. and. I, you know, his mom really did the best job. She's an occupational therapist, but she did a great job of noticing these little minute um, changes in the symmetry within his face, that there was a f slightly flattened nasio label fold on that right side. You can see the drooping in the blue when he's wearing the blue shirt down on that right side. And on in the red shirt, on that other picture, that post picture, you can see how symmetrical his smile is all the way from his eyes, all the way down to his chin. So this was a real successful story. And um, Julie's coming over to maybe help something with him. Okay. Someone lost down, so keep going. Okay, great. Um, so this was a real nice success case. And I, you know, really wanted to make the point that we had to reteach him how to chew, reteach him how to breathe properly, reteach his tongue proper posture in his mouth at rest during speech and during swallowing. And that by doing all of these, we created better facial symmetry and better function. So what is myofunctional therapy? It is a neurologic re-education. Again, don't hesitate to shout out questions if you have any about anything that I show you. Okay, so what does myofunctional therapy include now that we know that it's a neurologic re-education? Well, A number one on the list, which has to be done before we do anything else, is to eliminate oral habits. What are oral habits? Thumb sucking, finger sucking, nail biting, tongue chewing, tongue sucking, um, even something as simple as, as chewing on our sleeves or, or chewing on our hair or biting on pencils, all of these oral habits, they can have an effect. They can have a, an effect on the muscles of your face and the muscles within your mouth. And so we have to eliminate those first and foremost. Once we do that, we jump into teaching individuals how to breathe properly, how to breathe nasally. We do a breathing re-education. Um, I want you, and I go into a lot more detail of this um, when I teach my seminars, but I want you to think about this kind of um, slippery slope that people get on where they were possibly a thumb or a finger sucker. We're born as nasal breathers, guys, but if we constantly have our thumb or fingers in there, we train ourselves not to breathe through our nose. Our nose was created as a filter to get rid of all the... Um, the you know the um, germs and the and 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 accessory things that we do not need to take into our body, and um, then go and to be able to breathe down into our lungs. Versus orally, there's no filtering system, so things can just go directly back into our throat, directly down into our lungs. That's why we get a lot of inflammation in our airway tract, and so we want to think about teaching people how to breathe the way that they were meant to breathe, and that is through the nose. Um, and we have lots of different methods and exercises that help them do that. 
We also are working on correcting oral and facial resting posture. So that's resting posture of your lips, resting postures of your tongue, optimal closure of the teeth, um, and resting posture is, is a key point for, for people in our program. We also want to talk about how to chew and swallow correctly. Because so, so many of our patients, if they were longtime thumb or finger suckers and they were always eating very soft, mushy foods, they don't get to use the muscles that God gave them. Now, I'm not saying to go and grab a lamb shank and have them at the age of you know six months start chewing on a lamb shank bone. But what we do need to do is use it or you lose it, right? We hear that phrase all the time, use it or you lose it. So we do have to give a workout to our mastication muscles, our master, our buccinator, all those muscles that we use um, to adequately chew up and create a bolus to propel in the, in the mouth. And then of course we have to have proper placement of that bolus in order to swallow correctly. If our tongue is constantly pushing against or through the teeth every time we swallow, and we swallow 500 to 2,000 times a day, doesn't take a rocket scientist to know that that muscle is going to win. It is going to push anything out of the way in order to achieve a swallow. And if it pushes with enough force, it's going to push those teeth and that jaw and your alignment all out of the way in order to achieve what it needs to achieve. Okay? So chewing and swallowing um, are a big piece of the puzzle. And, and, and who's the experts on that? Speech language pathologists. We've done this for years, guys. Um, Another piece of myofunctional therapy is to habituate these good habits. So, so many people, they'll go in for treatment and they will be taught how to swallow properly. They'll be taught proper speech, but there's no carryover of that into everyday life. So we want to make sure that we are not releasing our patients just out too quickly, but that we're really making sure that they have those good habits in school, at home, um, during different activities, during physical activity, during sedentary activity. So we want to make sure those good habits are throughout the entire day. And of course, a big piece of what we do is correcting speech sound errors. I do not believe that you can have a complete and effective myofunctional therapy program without correcting speech sound errors. And I will talk about that as we go on. There are over 800 articles available that talk about myofunctional therapy, myofunctional disorders, and the different areas within myofunctional disorders. So whether it's dealing with breathing, whether it's doing with chewing, whether it's doing dealing with swallowing, whether it's dealing with craniofacial development, whether it's dealing with speech production, there are over 800 articles out there that we have at our fingertips to learn more about our treatment approach. There are two specific articles that I mentioned that were um, done with relation to speech articulation. And in one article by Kellum in 1992, um, it was found that 38% of various populations might have a myofunctional disorder. 38%, that's a huge number, guys. That's like only slightly less than half of the people walking around among us might have a myofunctional disorder. Versus in an article written by Maul in 1999, um, that was in the journal Speech and Hearing. There was an observation of 170 preschool children, and it said that 81% of the children with speech and articulation issues that they observed were li likely to have an underlying myofunctional disorder. That is, that's substantial. That means that so many of us are treating speech and articulation disorders, but we're not getting to the root of the problem, which is a myofunctional disorder. So we're doing them a disservice by not using what's in our arsenal and not using what we were trained to do, which is to do more than just correct articulation. Perla has a question. Great. There's a question from Perla. As a school-based SLP who has to be cautious about making outside referrals, how successful will OMT be for our students' referrals um, are not made to dentists and orthodontists? Meaning, Perla, that many of your students in your school are not receiving dentist and orthodontic treatment? How successful will OMT be for our students' referrals are not made 
to dentist orthodontist. I'm hoping, Perla, that you're asking a really important question, which is something about how how effective can our She's therapy saying. be within a school practice, um, possibly with lower income populations that might not have access to the dentistry and orthodontia that some of our other populations might. And it's a great question. Somebody once said, and I love this quote, I'll, I'll give credit to Linda Dianforio where I can, um, that the lips are the braces for your face and the tongue is a natural expander for the roof of your mouth. And I want, I want I'm going to say it again. The lips are the braces for your face. Okay. So your lips are the braces for your face. If they can stay closed, then they can put enough force on the teeth to keep the teeth from bucking out and pushing forward. And your tongue is a natural palatal expander for the roof of your mouth. If you think about the palate as being malleable like silly putty, of course, up until that time where it fully fuses um, you know, around puberty, Usually for girls, it's around 11 or 12. Boys, it can be a little bit older, but they like to get it done early. So that tongue can be a natural palatal expander. So if we can teach the tongue proper resting posture on the roof of the mouth, and we can teach the lips to remain closed at all times, we are creating enough force to make a change within the facial structure and within our oral cavity. So that was an awesome question. I have one more from Kim. Great. I don't typically see many thumb suckers and pacifier users as mouth breathers. Can you clarify how thumb sucking can lead to becoming a mouth breather? Is it due to reshaping of the palate or something else? Yes. Great question, Kim. Okay. One of the leading causes to malocclusion and open anterior bites is from thumb sucking and pacifier use, okay? I want you to think about, and I'll show you, the presence of a thumb being, and I'm gonna use a thumb just because it's easy to show, um, being in the mouth, pushing up on the palate. No. They can't see you. They can't see me. Let's see if we can get you to see me. Okay, so if you think about the thumb, and I'm going to show it this way, pushing up on the roof of the mouth, okay? Now, everybody sucks with different force. So some people might not be sucking um, with a lot of force. They might keep it just at the tip. Some people fully push back and up. But if that palate has not fully fused and it's malleable like silly putty, think about putty. Anytime that you put any bit of force, it creates a thumbprint. It creates a mark. Well, we're doing that on the roof of the mouth. And if you push up enough and for long enough on the roof of the mouth, you are actually pushing up the roof of the mouth is the floor of your nose, guys. The roof of your mouth is the floor of your nose. So if you are constantly pushing up and impinging on your nasal passages, if we can't breathe through our nose, guess how we're going to breathe? Through our mouth. Airway trumps everything, okay? There's another line I want you to think about. Is that better? Keep going. Okay. Just keep Hopefully, going. you guys can can see me. Um, I want at least I can be saying these things so you can can um, hear it. But muscle trumps bone. Okay, so that's where the tongue can trump the bone. It can push the teeth. Can push the mandible. Can push the maxilla. It's, it's pushing your jaw joints out of commission and out of where they should be properly aligned. But airway trumps everything. So we're going to choose to breathe. First and foremost, breathing is number one on our list. So if we have pushed up either from our thumb, from our fingers, from a pacifier um, into our oral cavity, so it impinges on our nasal cavities, we will mouth breathe, okay? At the same time, if we are mouth breathing, this is exciting, if we are mouth breathing and we don't have a filter and everything from the environment is getting into our oral cavity and down into our lungs, we're going to get inflammation of the tissues in the airway tract. Okay, We get enlarged tonsils, we get enlarged adenoids, and we just get inflammation of the tissue in the back of the pharynx. Again, what do we do if we can't breathe? We will adjust our body. We will hang our head. We will move ourselves in whatever way we need to in order to breathe. So airway trumps everything. So Kim, it's a great question because you're seeing kids who are mouth breathers. You have to get to the root of problem of why they're a mouth breather. Okay, something caused them to be a mouth breather because they were born a nasal breather. Guarantee it. They were born a nasal breather. 
unless there was some kind of airway impingement as, as an infant or in um, at the time of birth. So I want you to think about what might have caused that turn to be a mouth breather. Is the tongue tied? Is the tongue tied to the bottom of the mouth and sitting in an improper resting position either through the teeth or through the lips? Okay, um, because tied oral tethers, you know, tethered oral tissues, I should say, like short frenulums or frenums at the lip or under the tongue, all of those can have an effect on the way our facial structure is aligned, okay? Again, lips are the braces for our face, tongue is the natural expander for our roof of our mouth, and we become mouth breathers for a reason. So the, all great questions. Um, if I'm gonna scoop back here. So what you wanna do is turn your camera off. Yeah, oh, turn this off first. And then, yep. And then here. There. And, and then, then, okay. Great. And then. This webinar thing down. But in the meantime, I'm excited to share the information. So we were talking about a couple research articles talking specifically about speech articulation issues. I know that you guys are sitting there thinking about clients that you see either in the school or in your practice, and you're thinking to yourself, gosh, I'm wondering if that client might actually have an underlying myofunctional disorder, that maybe it's not just a straight up speech issue. Um, Wendy has a question. Sure. As a private practice SLP, she uses DX code of yes. M26.59 often for the kids who have oral habits such as thumb sucking, tongue sucking, et cetera. Yes. Do others use this as well? Asha told me to use it if it's for a tongue thrust. Right on, girl. That's Who is that? Wendy. Wendy, you're right on the mark. You're right on the mark. That's the one to use. And I use additional codes as well. I use R13.11, which is an oral phase dysphagia, because remember, guys, when somebody, if their swallow is improper and they're pushing their tongue either through or against their teeth or pushing it in some improper positioning, that is an oral phase dysphagia. And um, two years ago, not this past year, but the year before I was at ASHA, and I went to one of the only presentations on myofunctional therapy. It was from a professor in the University of Iowa. He is now retired, but he was brilliant. And I tried to find him for so long, but he's retired and, and, and gone. Um, but what he did was he had done a study that looked at people who had been diagnosed with a previous tongue thrust and individuals who had had some kind of neurological event. And he made a very strong correlation. I don't remember. I'll have to try to pull up the article um, or the, the presentation. But he made a very strong argument and found a strong correlation between a pre-existing myofunctional disorder leading to further complications with oral pharyngeal dysphagia. So think about it. If you don't swallow properly as a child and through adulthood, and then you have some kind of neurological event which further impairs your musculature and your function of swallowing, aren't you at higher risk? Well, obviously, yes, but he found a way to really prove it with his research, and I think it's something that adds even more value to what we're doing, that we have to remediate these issues when they're young so that when they get older, they're already starting out ahead of the game. All right, so let's see if I can move on. Let's look at some of these pictures, okay? What do they all have in common? I wanna see if some of you can shout out things that you see in these pictures. So obviously we've talked a little bit about this little cutie pie up in the left-hand corner, this little girl who has got her thumb so far wedged into her mouth. She's probably been doing that since she was in utero. And I'm sure mom and dad loved it at the time because she soothed herself to sleep and she slept like a baby. But unfortunately, that habit is going to wreak havoc in her mouth later if we don't get rid of it sooner rather than later. You can already see that her thumb is pushing up, up, up against the palate. It's pulling her upper jaw forward. It's bucking or protruding her upper front teeth, okay? It's also, depending on the pressure that's used, it can push and retract that lower jaw, which is a huge issue that the orthodontists are all seeing in their practice. We're getting an increase of this in our patients that are being treated by orthodontists, and they'll be the first to tell you that. You can see her tongue is completely in the wrong place. Pause. Sure. I can't see pictures. Oh, you can't see these pictures? Hmm. 
Hang tight, everybody. We're gonna figure out why these pictures are not popping up for you. Okay. All right. Let us know. If, let us know if you can see them. Yeah. Excellent. So we've got the little thumb sucker. I just want you to take note of her tongue, okay? Because her tongue is resting down underneath her thumb. It's pushing down and forward. Well, if you do that all day, every day, at night, as much as people usually thumb suck, it's going to teach that muscle to work improperly. And what you're going to end up with is the person in the middle who's got an anterior tongue thrust. Let's hope that that's not at rest. Let's hope that that's not during the swallow, but probably at both times. And you can see that it's pushing with such force that it's actually creating a malocclusion. It's creating an opening of those teeth and a protrusion of those teeth as the tongue rests improperly. Um, the picture all the way off to the right, I'm sure those working in schools and private practice, you see these guys. They have low tone and lip incompetence. They are mouth breathers. This is what that thumb sucker becomes. And you can see the tongue hanging forward almost through the lips, okay? This child is doing anything they can do to breathe. So we need to educate them on nasal breathing and really train their tongue proper placement within the mouth. We need to teach these lips to be closed. Um, and really, this is that's a quintessential picture right there of a myofunctional disorder. When we look down to the bottom left, I want you to see if anybody shouts out what that is down to the bottom left. Can you guys see? I know you can call it. That's right. Somebody shouted out that it is a short lingual frenum, mm -hmm. also known as a short lingual frenulum. Okay. We see this all the time, guys, and there's measurement tools that you can use to measure what is considered to be a short frenum and somebody who might need uh, um, a phrenectomy. And what you wanna do is make sure that you're going to the right oral surgeons, to the right ENTs, um, to the right, sometimes dentists and orthodontists even do these, but you gotta get the right practitioner. Because I can't tell you how many times I've seen kids who have had a lingual clipping, but it's not been adequate. And so they're still restricted. And what does restriction of the tongue do? Well, it keeps it resting on the bottom of the mouth and possibly through the teeth causing a malocclusion. It prevents the tongue from being able to rise up and live in that penthouse, to live up in the top of the mouth. So we have to know how to best identify these frenulums. Even if you're in the schools, you need to refer them out to get a clipping, but make sure that you're finding the right practitioner who's gonna do it adequately, all right? Um, our little Shih Tzu in the middle, they always have tongue thrusts. So you will see them with their little tongue resting in between their teeth all the time. You'll take notice of it more now than ever. And then off to the right, can anybody call what they see in that picture on the bottom right? This is something that's a little bit um, less identified by speech therapists, and I don't think that we have, not a lot of people think about it very often, but once I say it, it's gonna make a ton, ton, ton of sense. Anybody? Oh yeah, there's a little bit of a lag, so I'm gonna wait a moment and see if anybody can identify what's off to the right. Scalloped tongue. Oh, Melissa. Alyssa. Melissa. Kudos. Melissa. 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 Way to go, Melissa. Great. Excellent. It's a scalloped tongue. That's exactly right. And so why would somebody have a scalloped tongue? Well, if the tongue is made up of this epithelial mucosal layers that are really soft and kind of um, impressionable, I'll say, because I think that's the right word to use. You can imagine that if the tongue is not resting in a proper place within the oral cavity, those structures can leave a mark. And in this case, it's the teeth that are leaving a mark on the tongue. Why is it a problem? Well, it's a problem because it's telling you that the tongue is not resting in a proper place in the oral cavity. My tongue rests on the roof of my mouth, hopefully all of yours do too, and it is not touching the teeth. If somebody has lingual scalloping either on the sides or around their tongue, then it is because their tongue is literally resting like this. And if it rests like that long enough and for enough time, the teeth will leave their mark. So we have to get the tongue out of the way, teach its proper placement at rest, 
so that we can avoid and get rid of all this lingual scalloping. What does lingual scalloping lead to? Well, aside from creating issues with the bite and the teeth, it can lead to oral cancers if that tissue and those tissues become more lesion sites. So, um, you know, there, there is a big health risk associated with all this. This is real important that we identify this in our patients. So what do they all have in common? All these pictures could use myofunctional therapy. Um, don't treat the Shih Tzu, but know that he needs it. All right. So what are some different disorders that you might see or already see in your practice? And feel free to shout them out to Julie um, if any of you see these in your, in your practice, especially those in schools that, again, might be treating articulation or language issues, but might not be treating the underlying issue of the tongue and musculature of the face. So obviously, like we mentioned before, oral habits, okay? This, is, this will present in your practice and you have to remediate those first guys you have to have to um, the second one is, is is called many different things immature swallow reverse swallow tongue thrust swallow I think many of us when we were in grad school were introduced maybe to um, the tongue thrust book um, I, I Marcel Richardson is is amazing, and she did a fabulous job writing this workbook so so long ago. Um, so when we're in grad school, we hear about the tongue thrust. There are books like Swallow Right that also work on swallowing function because we are the experts in swallowing. Right? Um, there are. When I was in grad school, I remember my professor. May she rest in peace, Joan Ragnell. I love her. I always will. She gave me six pieces of paper that were stapled together, and it had six weeks of oral motor exercises. I mean, I never had a patient that I treated with it because I didn't know what I was looking for. But those exercises included teaching somebody how to properly swallow, how to put their tongue up on the roof of their mouth and snake back to the back um, so that you can propel a bolus into the pharynx. Another Myofunctional disorder we've talked a lot about is open mouth breathing. And, um, you know, I want you guys to think a lot about open mouth breathing. You're going to recognize it now in your patients more than you ever did before because there's a big move, like Nicole talks about, to recognize that open mouth breathing during the day means that we're having some kind of breathing abnormality at night as well when we're most relaxed. And that might include sleep disordered breathing, snoring sleep apnea, upper airway restrictive um, syndrome or respiratory syndrome. So again, we have to recognize these things so that we can best refer our patients to the sleeping experts so that we're not, we don't have patients that are putting themselves at risk. Because what Nicole makes so very clear to us is that sleep disordered breathing and, and, and inappropriate breathing can lead to longer term health consequences. Issues with attention, issues with breathing, issues with behavior, um, and obviously for me, orofacial myofunctional issues. So um, that's, you know, number three on the list, but could be number one. We want to be aware of structural abnormalities that we see in our patients. I went one time to a school for a kid. Um, I was working on some R's and I, I went to show um, the therapist, the school speech therapist, a program that I was doing with ours. And I said, I showed her on the one little kid. And I said, do you have anybody else who's had speech therapy for a really long time that you might want to bring down and we can try out the R program on the child? She said, yes, I have this little guy who's been in speech therapy since kindergarten. He was in fourth grade. Okay. He'd literally been in speech therapy since kindergarten through fourth grade. She brings him down. We start working within 30 seconds. I said, lift up your tongue. He had a severely short lingual frenulum. Well, dear Lord, of course he couldn't say his R's. But what we came to find out is that he was still thumb sucking. If you are still thumb sucking, how can your tongue ever learn proper placement if it's always down and forward with the thumb pushing up? He was a severe mouth breather. He had minimal airway patency of the nasal cavities. We sent him to the ENT. We sent him to the oral surgeon to get his frenulum clipping. We sent him to the orthodontist to have his palate expanded. Then we, as soon as that palate expander came out, we went to town working on proper positioning for the tongue at rest 
during speech and during swallowing. Guys, we've changed this little boy's life. He's not snoring at night. He's chewing more hearty, harder consistency foods that he wasn't able to chew. He's swallowing properly and guess, and we did exercises and we had attacked specific speech sounds. Guess what's happening to his speech? It's steadily improving. He could have been in speech therapy until forever and never gotten the results that he's getting now because he needed an interdisciplinary approach. This is exciting. This is exciting for us to know that we can make such a significant change in a person's life by just sending them to all the right players and us being a part of that interdisciplinary team. Okay. Other structural abnormalities that you might see are enlarged tonsils. Dear Lord, send them to those ENTs. Get those big golf balls out so these people can breathe properly. You might look and see a bifid uvula, indicative of a submucosal cleft. We might see a torus, which is like a bony growth that's along the palate as that palate is fusing together. So just be aware of the more than just looking at the tongue, we have to look at the whole facial complex. We already talked about lingual scalloping. That's a roadmap, guys. Lingual scalloping, it's a roadmap to where the tongue is sitting at rest. Grinding, clenching of the teeth, leading to TMJ issues. Um, Wendy has a, a comment question. I just sent a 14 year old for a revision of a restricted lingu lingual frenulum, and his speech is improving, improving. Pain for one week post surgery was worth all of it. A hundred percent, Wendy, a hundred percent. We are going to see a huge, huge wave in our field as speech pathologists. There used to be a lot of controversial articles out there saying per pediatricians, per lactation consultants, per speech pathologists saying, we don't really know what the functional outcome of clipping a lingual frenum is. I will tell you what the functional outcome is. Improved infant breastfeeding, okay? Improved feeding, chewing, and swallowing in toddlers, improved feeding, chewing, and swallowing in adults, and improved speech production. And that allows us maybe to encourage some nasal breathing. So all of this is a big picture that we're looking at, guys. I want you to think about it as, you know, there's um, Christy Gatto is, is um, out there, and she talks about the orofacial complex, that it's one big complex picture. And it is so, so very true. We can't have our blinders on. And I think it's what we've done for many years. We can't just have our blinders on and be focusing just on articulation or just on feeding or just on chewing. We have to look at this as one big picture and we have to pull in the professionals that are going to best help us. So Wendy, awesome, awesome job. Actually, I actually have a great question too from Elaine. Yes. Um, Elaine asks, can you address ways to eliminate thumb sucking? Yes. Okay. So I'm going to get to that next. So Elaine, I'm coming up with, with that. Let me get to the last issue that in myofunctional disorders is speech sound errors. Okay. I'm going to zip through this and then get to Elaine's question. Okay. So, cause I know that we're, our time is going, going, I could talk about this all day guys. Okay. So what are the consequences of untreated myofunctional disorders? Things that you're going to see in your clients, you're going to see orthodontic relapse. I literally could name 10 kids that are 17 years old that are on my caseload right now that had braces for one, two, or possibly three phases. And they've all had orthodontic relapse. Why? Because they didn't treat the underlying issue of the tongue pushing through the teeth. When you have an orthodontist, or functional dentist that is on the same page as you and knows that you need to be an integral part of that program, they will minimize their orthodontic relapse. I had an orthodontist who said he used to have way many more patients with relapse than he does now. Now he has nobody relapse because they all come see us, as Simon says. You're gonna see the consequence of breathing disorders. We just talked about them. Sleep disordered breathing, obstructive sleep apnea, and upper airway um, respiratory syndrome. Um, Poor dental health, periodontal disease. Guys, you're gonna see people that push their tongue down against those bottom teeth with such force and with such frequency that it's actually wearing down the gums um, in, their, in their mouth. You're gonna see malocclusions. You're gonna see anterior open bites. You're gonna see lateral open bites. You're gonna actually see people pushing themselves into a class three, which is a, that underbite that we know about. Um, you're gonna see jaw joint problems. You're gonna see people with TMJ issues, facial pain. 
these are again consequences of not treating underlying myofunctional disorders. We talked about the biting, chewing, and swallowing abnormalities. People that are eating soft foods at the age of 25 because they prefer mac and cheese and chicken nuggets to eating steak and chicken because they can't chew it. They literally have no musculature in their face to be able to masticate those foods. Excessive grinding of the teeth, bruxing, wearing down your um, your teeth, requiring mouth guards and, and different bite appliances. Lifelong long misarticulations. I mean, don't we walk around? We can't stand when we hear somebody with a misarticulation. All we want to do is jump in and help. Um, and obviously, improper use of facial, facial musculature. If you use your face improperly, um, it will cause a change. I, I'm just going to point out, I, I'm a pretty happy person. I'm pretty expressive, and I'm constantly raising my eyebrows up because I'm expressive when I talk. Well, there's some lovely lines there, okay? If you are constantly overusing the mentalis muscle, or the orbicularis oris, and you are pursing your lips just to keep them closed, to keep the tongue from coming out, you're going to leave a mark, and you're going to see that mark left on the face. Okay, so the list goes on and on. These are the consequences. So the And this is an article that I'm just going to mention. It is like when you go and talk to your orthodontists, you're going to want to quote this article. It, it was written by Smith Peter et al. It was released in 2010 in the American Association of Orthodontics. And this is an article that really is a game changer for um, myofunctional therapists working with orthodontists. They took a group of people and they divided them into a control group and experimental group. And in the experimental group, they let them receive myofunctional therapy in conjunction with the orthodontic appliances. Then they took their control group that only got orthodontic appliances as alone, okay? So no myofunctional therapy. Put the braces on, put an expander in, put some kind of force appliance in, and you will change the teeth. But then they looked at the relapse. In those in the control group, 3.4 millimeters of change versus 0.5 millimeters of change. This was within a six month time period, guys. In six months, their bites opened totally back up in the control group, but those that got myofunctional therapy were taught proper positioning of the tongue for swallowing speech and at rest, they did not have relapse. 0.5 is probably, if you talk to an orthodontist, almost within um, normal that you would see. So this article I take into all my lunch and learns. I share it all the time with professionals that are in my interdisciplinary approach. So what's the answer? What do we want to talk about today? Today we want to talk about the Simon Says Myofunctional Therapy Programs. There are two great programs out there that I've created. One is Thumbs Up, and this is for Kim Elaine. Elaine, Elaine this is for you. So I have a 30-day thumb sucking elimination program. It is behavioral modification. It is powerful, positive, behavioral change that we see. It is incredibly empowering to the kids, okay? I've had kids that have said, if I could do this, I can do anything because they've been sucking their thumbs since they've been in utero and they have no idea how to change that habit. So we work with the parents. You have to have this perfect triad. You have to have a slightly bribable kid. You have to have a parent that's almost willing to like cut their thumb off. They're so frustrated. And you have to have the outside therapist, which is you. And thumbs up is fun and it is exciting and um, there's lots of educational tools. I've created a um, a comic book. Can they see this if I hold it up? Um, in one second, they can. Okay. Well, I can hold it up at the end. Okay. So nine years ago when I took my um, had this idea in my mind of creating a comic book because kids love comics and cartoons. And so I'm so excited, you know, within the past six months, we came out with thumbs up. Can we see it. Okay. And this is thumbs up. He's our superhero. He's our character. And he goes around helping children become their own superhero. And we talk about the thumb becoming um, a bully within the mouth, pushing the teeth apart, making a thumbprint on the roof of the mouth and making the muscles in the tongue weak. And then we teach the child to be their own superhero and they even get to um, write down their goals, their strategies and their rewards. Um, they love this. I have, I have a, a um, 
video that they watch, an educational video, and um, they all succeed. I don't let anybody fail. I've only had three people fail in the nine years, and there were extenuating circumstances you don't want to hear about. So in Thumbs Up program, it is one of the most fun things I do in my practice. Everybody succeeds, and then once they're done with that program, um, when timing is right, then we get them into the Tongue Tips program. So I'm going to turn this off, go here, say OK. And not showing up. There we go. Okay. So how long, the program is called Tongue Tips. Why do we call it Tongue Tips? Because you have lots of tips. You have lots of reminders, whether it's keeping your tongue on the roof of your mouth at rest, whether it's breathing through your nose, whether it's pushing your tongue up back and swallowing properly, whether it's chewing on both sides of your mouth and keeping your lips closed um, while you prepare a bolus. So there are lots of tongue tips that we teach our clients. I say that it's 12 sessions on average because it really varies from client to client. If somebody is already a nose breather, then I don't have to do breathing exercises with them. If somebody already has correct speech sounds, I don't need to do um, you know classic speech therapy on them. If somebody has um, adequate lip tone and competence, then I don't need to do all those lip exercises with them. So even though we tailor, we, you know, have, I call it the cookbook, don't we always tailor programs to what the individual needs of our clients are? We do. So it's a series of therapeutic exercises for the lips, for the tongue, for the facial muscles. We teach a new swallow, we teach proper breathing, and we do speech therapy. Here's my issue. Does somebody have a question? Kurtla has one question. Yes. If I could start implementing one strategy slash behavior immediately for my articulation students who obviously benefit from OMT, what would that be? Okay. Step number one would be getting proper tongue resting posture with the lips closed breathing through the nose. Okay, Perla, that's number one that you want to be thinking of. Getting proper tongue rest posture and use little sticky spots to get their tongue tip up on the alve alveolar ridge. See if they can flatten their tongue approximate their teeth, close their lips, and breathe through their nose. You can, and I know it's going to freak you out if I say this, but you can go get very thin 3M medical tape from CVS, and you can try to tape their lips horizontally, not horizontally, but vertically, okay? Because that, you know, might be able to make them feel a little bit more comfortable. Make sure that they have airway patency. Send them to an ENT to make sure they can breathe through their nose. Have them breathe through each nares to see which airway might be um, obstructed. So you wanna make sure that, yes, we're encouraging nasal breathing, but we have to make sure with our ENT that that patient is able to breathe through their nose adequately. We don't wanna put people into respiratory distress. The second thing that you can do is do oral motor with intention, okay? so. People poo-pooed oral motor for many years in the field of speech pathology. Don't poo-poo it. Integrate it into your practice, but make it have intention. Do oral motor exercises from tongue tips, tongue from the tongue thrust program, whatever it is that you choose to use, getting the tongue stronger for proper positioning, okay? One more question yes. from Laura. Yes. Does a child need to go to an ENT before working on mouth breathing to make sure the airway is clear? Yes, I would like them to. Okay. I would like them to. I want to make sure that it's safe because I don't want that's why you create your interdisciplinary team, guys. Um, if if they have the ability to. If they don't and you're working in a lower income population, do what you can to assess whether they are able to comfortably breathe through their nose and then encourage that time to just increase. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. So speaking of the interdisciplinary team, who is in your interdisciplinary team? The speech therapist. You are the myofunctional expert, okay? You're working with orthodontists. You're working with dentists. Um, you might be working with dental hygienists. You might be working with, you should work with ENTs and oral surgeons, pediatricians, and osteopaths. This is your group, okay? I think 
that because I worked for 20 years in um, neuro rehab and I worked in rehab hospitals in the Maryland and DC area, I constantly was on an interdisciplinary team with the PTs and the OTs and the neurologists and the neurosurgeon, the social worker, et cetera. So this idea of working together in a team approach has always come very natural to me, but it's not always the case for all of you practitioners out there. So I want you guys to be thinking about creating your interdisciplinary team of people that are aligned in the same thought process that myofunctional therapy is important. And um, if you, I, I have to say this, I think it's super important that I make a comment about this, which is that um, speech therapists are the best providers of myofunctional therapy. Nobody will ever tell me otherwise, okay? I am really strong in believing this. In our scope of practice, if you look under ASHA and their scope of practice, and Linda Dionforio talked about this in her whole hour-long presentation at ASHA this year. Um, I'm talking really fast because I know our time is getting quick. We are ready to go. Okay. Um, she did a whole presentation that speech therapists already within our scope of practice, under feeding, under chewing, under swallowing, is all about myofunctional therapy. There are so many children and adults that I have seen that received speech therapy when they were younger from a speech therapist who never addressed their myofunctional needs. And conversely, I have seen tons of kids that have gone to myofunctional therapists that are dental hygienists and they have remediated and strengthened the muscle of their tongue. But guess what they never remediated? Their speech, because it is not in their scope of practice. They are not speech language pathologists. And I have seen more cases than I can even count on a hundred hands that there is a speech component that has to be addressed. You cannot leave somebody halfway done. But us speech therapists, guys, this is our niche market. This is our arena. This is our area of expertise. And they don't teach it to us in graduate school. Okay, I got six pieces of paper stapled together. And I've spent the last eight years building my practice based around myofunctional therapy. And now I want to take that and share it with you guys. So this page that you're seeing now, which talks about questions to think about, these are questions that I take in with me when I go and do my lunch and learns to my orthodontist, to my dentist, to the pediatricians. I ask them what they do with their mouth breathers. I ask them what they do with their tongue thrusters. I ask them what they do with thumb and, and finger sucking. Um, I, I, yeah, you have a question. Uh, Alexander asks, what is your opinion on dental devices for stopping thumb sucking? Okay. I hate them. <laughs> and, and actually, um, wait, who is that again? Alexandra. Alexandra. Great question. The orthodontist and the dentist hate them too. To put a big sharp rake or crib in somebody's mouth that hangs halfway back in their palate Make them talk like this and you just not treat their tongue in the right place to be. If your tongue is not resting, in the right place in your mouth, which is the roof of the mouth, because it has a big crib hanging down, and it's pushing against that crib every time you swallow and every time you speak, um, and every time you speak, when that crib or that rake comes out, it has not been trained properly. The tongue will push back against the teeth. It does absolutely nothing, and your dentist and your orthodontist will agree, and if they don't, they're just taking people's money. So Alexandra has a follow-up, and she says, I hate them too, but several of my most recent clients, dentists, are suggesting them. Do you have suggestions for eliminating thumb sucking? Yes. So come to my seminar, and I'm going to teach you thumbs up, and then you're going to go back, and you are going to go treat your patients and eliminate their thumb sucking habits. Then you're going to go into your dentist and your orthodontist. You're going to share your program, and they're going to refer everybody under the sun to you, and you're going to make a ton of money. So let's get to the business piece of this, okay? Um, let's talk about what the upcoming seminars are. I am, I've been doing these seminars now for about a year. I've done them mostly in Baltimore, Maryland, because I'm from Rockville, Bethesda area. And now I'm moving around the country because there's such a need for teaching speech therapists about myofunctional therapy. So in April, I'm going to Dallas. In um, July, I'm going to LA and I'm bringing my favorite orthodontist with me. He's going to come speak in Dallas. I'm going to show some um, video footage of him because he can't make it. And in Baltimore, I'll be in October, I'll be back here in Baltimore. This is what you're going to learn at the seminars. It's a three day program. Okay. In that three days, you're going to become trained in myofunctional therapy and diagnosing myofunctional disorders. You are going to be certified in these Simon Says programs in tongue tips and thumbs up. Okay, you're going to learn how to eliminate thumb sucking and finger sucking once and for all in 30 days. Anybody who tells you that it's less than 30-day program, anybody who tells you can be remediated in 10 days has not done it. 
I've treated over 400 kids with this. I could count on one hand people that could do it in 10 days. Okay. The 30 day program is written in stone and it's what these kids need. Tongue tips is like I said, this cookbook. Can they see me if I hold this up? I can do it right uh, now. That's all right. I can show them afterwards. Okay. All the, all the gear. Um, you're going to get access to all of my materials, my programs, the accessories for the programs. And you're going to get a full day, guys. This is the key. You're going to get a full day of personalized business development and goal setting so that you can implement myofunctional therapy. I left my training eight years ago. I was one of three speech therapists in a room of 40 people. They were all dentists and dental hygienists. And I left and I knew this was my niche market. I knew it was the right fit for me, but I was not a business person. Great clinician, loved helping people, but was not innately a business person. I've spent eight years perfecting that, and what I strive to do when I train speech therapists is that I want you to leave my program and the next day be able to implement these programs into your practice and be lucrative and be financially successful. So whether you're looking to implement it in your practice in a school or whether you're looking to make some money on the side, I work two days a week. I'm a mom of four. Okay, guys, I'm a mom of four kids. I work two days a week, and I make more money now than I ever did for the years working in the hospitals, more money than I did working in private practice, not focusing on myofunctional therapy. I have more patients than I can count. I have an overflow and a waiting list. Okay, so my goal is to help you identify what it is that your specific business plan is. I have leadership trainers from Dale Carnegie that come in. I have people who help you set your clear performance goals. And then I have a marketing team and a technology support team to help you figure out how to create that business plan and, and execute it. Okay, so I want you to walk out being successful. So, uh, um, yeah, last page was thank you. Oh, this has Deanna's contact, so that's not, we'll get out of that. Okay, great. her students practice proper tongue and lip resting posture at mm -hmm. home, but she's afraid they'll be doing it wrong. Is there a recommendation for transitioning from the therapy room to home? Which I think Sure. Is. So Perla, great question. In, um, in assignment says programs, the tongue tips is one of our programs and it's essentially like a cookbook. So it has a list with icons for the kids so that they know what they're working on. Tongue exercises, swallowing exercises, lip exercises, breathing exercises, speech exercises. And when they do them, you do it with them and then they go home and do it on their own. Okay. Once you've been trained in Simon Says programs, you are going to get your own Kindle Fire. And on this will be videos of all your exercises so you can actually use them and show them to your kids. You can share them if they have access to a computer at home. So if they forget, they have a way to access them at home. Okay. In this is not just the event presentation that we do, but it is all the exercises, flashcards, videos, research articles, um, assessments, and the cookbooks that you can print and use this as you need it. Um, back in the old days, we used to, you know, give this big binder with everything that you needed in it but then we found it was a little bit more efficient you know efficient and effective if we just gave everybody a kindle um of course at the program you're, you're going to get the the cookbooks you're going to get the comic book you're going to get cards with your exercises um you can see my marketing materials these are marketing materials that i've made um that explain what tongue tips is what thumbs up is, okay? Um, I wanna talk to you guys about the Simon Says Seminar because I'm hoping that you'll join me either in Dallas or in LA or in Maryland in October. Again, in that three days, you're gonna get more detailed information about myofunctional disorders, okay, and therapy because an hour is not nearly enough, as you can tell. Um, I want to teach you the programs, practice the programs. I have patients come in, we do assessments on them. We have thumb suckers come in, you get all my materials that you need, um, you get a kit yourself to practice on your own, and then the last day, like I said, is all business development, because I want you to walk out and be successful. I had an eight-year learning curve, and I just, I don't want you guys to have an eight-year learning curve. I want it to be one day, one week. Oh yeah, if you sign up in the next week, 
So anybody who's watching this webinar, until February 20th, you can get $500 off of our Simon Says seminars, okay, of our, of our three-day workshop. So currently the price is $2,000. If you sign up in the next week, it'll be $1,500. For that $1,500, you get all the materials, everything that you would need to start implementing myofunctional therapy. And I just put it up for them. Okay, and Julie just put up the link below. So you can click on that link and it will take you to the registration page. And if, yeah. Laura has one question. Is yes. there a certification process to be a myofunctional therapist or the training courses is all that she would need? Okay. Guess what guys? You want to know what certification you need to be a myofunctional therapist? It's called getting your C's, getting your state licensure and being a speech pathologist. That's how I feel about it. It is already in our scope of practice per ASHA that we are deemed ready to be myofunctional therapists. There are training programs out there that do give certification, okay? So there are programs that will give certified certification of oral myology. Here's the issue, that was created so that they could certify practitioners other than speech pathologists. They certified registered, they certify registered dental hygienists, PTs, OTs, dentists, orthodontists. None of those people can address speech sound articulation errors and really swallowing in the way that we do. We are the feeding, chewing, and swallowing experts. Okay, guys, we are the best people, and all you need is your C's. So I will certify you in my two programs. I will certify that you are able to provide tongue tips and thumbs up, and you can go running. Um, and that is all you need. I've been doing it for eight years. I haven't needed any further certification, and I am doing just fine and successful. And I feel great about the therapy I provide. Um, any other questions? That was, we had over a hundred people. We had, guys, this is exciting. We had over a hundred people join us today on this webinar. So thank you so much for those bold enough to reach out with your questions. Loved having you all. And I hope to see you at the seminar. Just be sure to sign up quickly, sooner rather than later, because there is limited space. And I know that in LA, we're almost full. I think we only have a few spots left in that in that seminar. So make sure to sign up um, sooner rather than later because we would love to have you. And um, again, it'll be up $500 off for the next week. If you have any questions after this webinar, feel free to email us. Happy to answer any questions. Julie, did you put your email there or should? Um, yeah, they're going to be getting an email. From okay. Me. So Julie's going to send out an email to you guys if you have any questions specifically about myofunctional therapy. Um, or just in general about our seminars and um, workshops. I, I want you guys to get as excited about myofunctional therapy as I am. It's been a really awesome, really awesome kind of kind of trajectory, trajectory for me in with my practice. And I hope that it is for you too. So um, thanks for being here today, and I hope to see you at a seminar. Take care.